while they're headed back, if you would like to open your Bible or grab one of the Bibles under the seat or open your app, we're going to be in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24 today. It's on page 998 if you're using one of the pew Bibles somewhere around you in one of those uh, seat trays. Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24. I'd like to read that if you'd like to follow along with me. God's Word says, Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know His will and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law, and if you are convinced you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor uh, uh, of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, then you who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal, do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Let's pray. Oh Lord, help me to communicate the message you have for us from this text right. Not veering one way or the other, but sticking true to what you have for us. God, help us to understand your word. Holy Spirit, illuminate this for us. Let us see the salvation of Jesus Christ in it. Lord, let us be transformed by what we encounter today as we dig into your word. Lord, let us dig deeply in that well, that we would be richly blessed from it. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the challenge about preaching through Romans is how layered Paul's arguments are. I mean, they just seem to sort of layer on top of one another and in interconnect like, like Lego blocks. Chapter 1 through 3 argues for the need for the gospel. It's pointing out our deep need for the gospel. But that's 1 through 3. Then 2 through 4 actually shows us that the law doesn't save but instead we're justified by faith. And they're like interconnected together. They work perfectly. They overlap with one another. It's absolutely masterful how God has inspired this and put it together. And so what would be ideal is if we could just work through, you know, chapters one through four or five or six this morning, but we're not accustomed to listening to five-hour sermons. And if one of you were to fall asleep in the window and fall out and break your neck and die, I don't know if I could raise you from the dead like Paul did. So <laughs> I think what we're going to do instead is we're just going to take a small piece from chapter 2 that I just read, and I'll deal with that. And then next week, Pastor Josiah is going to take the next piece after that, and we're just going to work through it little by little, and on we go, just one step after another. So for this sermon, for this morning, I plan to look at what Paul was saying to his original audience in Rome, in the church in Rome. And then I want to see what God has in that for us. And then after I unpack that for a bit, then I would like to conclude with just a single thought about how that should inform us in our Christian journey. So that's my plan. Let's go ahead and look at what Paul was saying to the church in Rome in this letter. So he starts out in verse 17, right out of the gates. It, he lets us know that he's specifically talking to Jewish people or people who've converted to Judaism. Verse 17 says, if you call yourself a Jew. So he's not talking about ethereal Jews out there. He's saying, you guys, I'm talking to you. If you call yourself a Jew. Also in verse 17, he says, and if you rely on the law. And then he goes on for a few verses about what that would look like. You instruct others. You believe that foundation is found in the law. You believe that you're going to keep the law right. He's going through that. And you, you feel like you're qualified to help anybody else because you've got this thing down. You know it. That is who he's talking about. That's who he's talking to. And these individuals seem to be boasting, or it looks like from this, they were boasting in their knowledge of the law thinking themselves teachers to the blind, thinking themselves above the others who might be ignorant, um, absolutely relying on that. We see that in like verse 
21, Paul starts asking them some questions. Okay, so if you're a teacher and you say, don't steal, if you teach others, don't steal, then what you've just done is you've proven that you know the law says, don't steal. You see that? You've proven that you know because you've taught it to others. In verse 22, he says, do you teach don't commit adultery? Of course you do. So then what happens if you go commit adultery? You just violated what you taught, so you don't commit adultery. That's the idea. Uh, Also in verse 22, do you detest idols? And do you go and rob the idols from their temples? Or that's kind of a, a way of saying, do you then engage in idol worship yourself? Do you see the setup here? Do you see what he's, he's doing? They're nodding, right? They're hearing this like, yeah, I'm a teacher of the law. I do rely on the law. Yep, I do teach don't steal. I, that's me. Yep, I'm, I'm with you. I do teach don't commit adultery. You see it? It's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. Paul's sucking them in. Come here, get real close here because he's got this like knockout punch winding up back here. Come on, come on, just lean in. Here we go, right? That, that's what's happening here. It's a knockout punch, and it's coming. And then you have where the punch actually lands. The punch is coming in verse 23, but we have kind of a tricky thing playing out here. And so I'm going to get a little nerdy here for just a moment. In Greek, in rhetorical questions, we have these little clue words. Clue words that would let us know if the answer to a rhetorical question is supposed to be yes or if the answer is supposed to be no. That way there's no doubt. And so the two words we see in this text, they're the negative, they're ooh and may. And so when you see that in the question, you know the answer is no. If it's may, the answer is nay. Like that's that's how that works. So we see that in these questions he's asking. You don't teach this and then do that, do you? You don't do this and do that. But then when you get to verse 23, we don't have any clue words. We don't have those rhetorical clue questioning words. And then there's something else going on that is hotly debated. Not only are there no clue words, there's not really even any questioning words. And there's actually not a question mark. See, because in the first century, they didn't have punctuation. So they didn't have a period or a semicolon or a question mark. And by the way, a Greek question mark looks like our semicolon. But anyway... Some later manuscripts, when they started putting punctuation in there, put a period. Some put a question mark. Some put a semicolon. So now what do we do with this? Is it a question? Is it a statement? How are we to translate this? And luckily there are people who've dedicated their entire lives to the study of Greek punctuation and Greek stuff. And so the translators are stuck with this really difficult decision they have to make. Right? The tone seems to suggest that it's the knockout punch. The tone would suggest that it's the concluding question coming in on the heels of the line of questioning that Paul is leading up to. But do you go with some manuscripts that have a question mark and translate it as a question, which the CSB translators did? Or do you go with others to make it a period and make it a statement. That's kind of up for all that debate, but either way, we need to know this. Either way, there's no way that question was just some fact-finding question of intrigue. Hey, do you do this? I wonder. That's interesting. This is the, the concluding punch, whether a question or a sentence. This is the conclusion to what he's lining up to. He's saying, you have a big problem. You're a hypocrite. You are a hypocrite. It's so much so that verse 24 tells us that even the Gentiles see it. Your hypocrisy can be seen a mile away and even the Gentiles see it. So stop fooling yourself. You're a hypocrite. You're boasting in the law and that's where you say you find your salvation and yet just by this line of questioning, Paul can prove they've already failed. They've failed in the law that their boasting is their salvation, therefore they have no salvation. He's showing them right there. They have a big problem. Why boast at all? You failed. You've blown it. This isn't, this isn't showing them that they're succeeding in the law and they're saved in it. In this case, the law is actually condemning them. 
You know the law, you failed the law, therefore you're condemned. And the way they're acting is like a person driving a Ferrari with a Buy American bumper sticker on the back. (laughs) And before you start Googling, Ferrari has no manufacturing plant in the United States. They're made exclusively in Italy. But that's the hypocrisy that these folks are doing, and they're doing it in a big flashy way that the Gentiles can see. So here's the big problem that's being pointed out. Here's the problem with the Jews who are boasting in the law. You ready? The law is powerless to save. Under no circumstance can you be saved by the law. Romans 3.20 says, For no one, hear that? For no one will be justified, be able to stand before God saved. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law Because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. The law is like this big spotlight that's just shining on the heart and showing our need for salvation. If you would, turn with me to Romans, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10. You might remember we went through this in our series. Uh, Page 1066 in the Pew Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. I want to look at verses 1 through 4. It's helpful to see how we're to understand the law. So here's some commentary on just that very thing. Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4 says, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshiper by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers, purified once and for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats in the law, even if following the law perfectly, cannot take away sin. But there is a blood that can. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 says, In him... Who's being talked about here? Jesus. In him we have redemption. How? Through his blood. The forgiveness of our, of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. Or how about Colossians 1, 19 and 20? For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, Jesus, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, how? By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The message of the Bible is that we can be saved and redeemed and that we can have peace with God, not by keeping the rules of the law perfectly. It isn't going to happen. But by trusting Jesus, who kept and keeps the laws perfectly on our behalf. The message of the gospel says that if you believe Jesus and you trust that he is Lord, that you trust his promises, that you follow him, that you rest in him, it says you will be given the right to be a child of God. You'll be brought into the family and his sacrifice will fulfill the law for you. Whereas your own efforts will come up grossly short. His blood will wash over you and make you clean. Whereas the blood of bulls and goats or even your own or your sweat or your labor will fall short. Boasting in the law like these Jewish individuals were doing just simply causes us to miss the gospel of Jesus Christ completely. Galatians 3.24 says, The law then was our guardian, or some translations say schoolmaster, was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. Now here's the million dollar question. If the law doesn't save, how do people in the Old Testament get saved? How does that work? And the temptation is to say, well, they did the bull thing, and they cut the throat, and then their blood was gushed out, and that saved them, and the sin was put on them, and then the sin was forgiven completely. But we just heard the law is powerless. So wait a minute. How did the people of the Old Testament get saved? The same way you and I do. The exact same way. They trust God. They believed 
his promises. They had faith that if they trusted God and if they followed God and they did the things that he told them to do, which in this case was the bull blood thing, if they did that, if we trust God, then God would save them. So it wasn't the bull and the blood. It's their trust in the Lord. It's their faith. They knew that he was sending a savior. The Old Testament word for that is Messiah. That's the same New Testament word, Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's Christ the Messiah. Christ the sa- or Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Savior. Messiah, Christ. They knew God is sending us the one who will do it because the law shows me my sin. The law shows me death. The law shows me this whole blood sacrifice thing is bad and it's just not cutting it. But God, my trust and my faith in him will save me. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was his trust. It was his faith. It's like this. It's like our Father in heaven handed them, in the Old Testament, a credit card. Okay, and the name on the credit card was the promised one, Messiah, the suffering servant, the Lamb of God. And they took that credit card, and in that they found their salvation. But after the cross, the credit card was paid off in full, and a debit card was issued. And on that debit card is the name Jesus Christ, and it's the same guy. Paid in full. In the Old Testament, they were saved on credit. In the New Testament, we are saved on debit. And it's exactly the same both ways. We are saved by faith. We get the wonderful benefit of just simply knowing the Savior's name. So when we get to heaven and they say, why should I let you in? You can say, because the man on the middle cross said I could come. Because Jesus Christ promised that I could be here. But what about the ones in the Old Testament? Here's what they do. They get to heaven and God says, why should I let you in? And they say, because you promised that Messiah for me. Same thing. Old Testament, New Testament. There's still another problem. The Jews, you know, these Jews knew a lot. They were encouraged to memorize lots of scripture. They had it in a little box they wore on their head. They wrapped it around their arms. They wrote it on their doorposts. They were really, really, really serious about the law, about Scripture. They knew it inside and out. They would have to. They didn't have copies of the Bible. They had to memorize this stuff. They sung it in songs. It was serious catechism. I'm sure the ones who struggled the most with Paul's letter were the ones who actually knew their Old Testament the best. I'm sure they had the hardest time Because knowledge isn't enough. Knowledge isn't enough. You can know and memorize the entire Bible, but that's not going to do it. Knowledge isn't enough. This is what James means when he says, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. That's James 2.17. It's not enough to have knowledge and just simply believe that it's true. Because James 2.19 says even the demons believe and they shudder. And then you say, well, hold on a second. Does that mean that we're saved by the work that we do? No, no, no. It means that if you don't have fruit, you don't have the right root. It means something's not working right. Your belief is not actually faith that's moving and shaping you and transforming you. Faith in true belief informs our behaviors. It informs our worldview. It informs our thoughts. How many of you got up this morning? Did, any of you, did all of you get up today? How many of you got up today? You got out of bed and you got up. You know why? Because you believed the sun was going to come up and there was a day that God had created for you. Your belief in that informed your behavior. If you didn't truly believe it, you wouldn't have got out of bed. Person's knowledge of the truth must inform and shape everything about them. Their faith must be motivated by what they really truly know and what they really truly believe. And all of you practice this every day. You have faith that you can take a piece of paper or a plastic card and you can purchase stuff if there's enough money in your account or if that paper has a one or 20 or today 100 on it. You have faith that that will actually happen. Isn't it a miracle? I'm going to go over here, I'm going to take goods and actual things, food that was made for me, and I'm just going to swipe my plastic card. I have faith that that's all going to work. And so it informs your behavior. You're not lugging around gold to trade or chickens or eggs. 
Right? This is how our faith should work. Our beliefs and our faith should motivate our behaviors. If action isn't what saves a person, and knowing the Bible perfectly you know, should actually teach us that our faith should have something behind it. Same thing for those Jewish people. But if the knowledge of the gospel for us doesn't shape everything about the Christian, if it doesn't inform us and transform us, then we might have reason to think that our faith is empty, that our faith is dead. Maybe we just have a hedge knowledge faith that's not actually compelling us to something more. Okay, here's a test on how this works. I don't want to out any of you, but let's take the test together. By a show of hands, how many of you know that you're supposed to brush your teeth every day? How many of you have heard you're supposed to brush your teeth after every meal? Okay, let's take it a little deeper. How many of you have been told by your dentist you're supposed to floss? Ever heard of that? We've all heard that. How many of you have been told you're supposed to floss daily? That's a lot of hands. Do you all believe it's true? Or do you believe the dentist is just full of hot air? I believe it's true. How many of you believe it's true you should floss? It'd be better for your mouth if you flossed. I believe it. I see a lot of hands. How many of you floss every day? Whoa. You have the knowledge. Are you telling me the knowledge has not informed your behavior? A Christian should demonstrate a knowledge that has transformed behavior. That's what this is about. Paul was challenging those to say it's not enough to know what's best. You've got to do what's best. He was challenging these Jewish individuals to say, look, your faith cannot be in the law. The law does not contain a saving faith. It tells you how to have a saving faith. It tells you the one in which you could put your faith, but it in itself does not save. They needed more than the law. They needed the gospel. And that's been his argument from chapter 1 that goes all the way to chapter 3. Sinners need the gospel. Sinners who think they have the law and aren't sinners need the gospel. We all need the gospel. And so at this point, it'd be really easy to just point a finger at the Jews who relied on the law and look at that, and even some Jews today who don't accept Jesus, and some of those people. Friends, the, the truth is there are people, even in here, maybe even once in a while in us, or maybe often in us, or maybe all the time in us, who might be very much just like those Jewish people putting their faith in the, the do's and the don'ts, the rules, the law, the Bible. I read my Bible every day. That's, that's it. That's all I got to do. If I just read the Bible, check, it doesn't transform my life one bit. It doesn't change one thing that I do. We're not any different. It is extremely easy, too easy, especially in America, to make Christianity about acting the right way. It's about avoiding the wrong things about towing the line, knowing the lingo, being a moral person, doing this, avoiding that, voting the right way, getting angry about the right things, not going and getting involved in the wrong things, drawing a line in the sand in the right places. Is that not what Americans so desperately want to make Christianity about? We could be tempted to think if we memorize enough scripture, or if we read the Bible enough times, if we read it every day or this much a week or whatever, if we have good attendance in our fellowship groups, that we're good Christians in right standing with God. Now, it might be that we're good Christians in right standing with God, but not for those reasons. Not for those reasons at all. Those things are purely the fruit that shows you where your affections are, where you want to be. That's all that is. The reality is we should rely on Jesus alone for salvation. Christ alone. I'm even tempted to say, oh, the gospel saves. I have news for you. The gospel does not save. Jesus saves. The gospel tells us about this Jesus who saves. The Bible doesn't save. The Bible tells us about this Jesus in whom we should have our affections and whom we should trust. 
Jesus saves. Salvation is in Christ and him alone. Nothing more. We should be relying on Christ, not the law, although it's so tempting to do. Paul's point here to these Jewish individuals was that those who rely on the law condemn themselves. They fell short of what they should know. What they should have known was that it is in God whom they should place their trust. The same is true of us when we rely on the law, whatever it is you've made the law. We all need the saving work of Jesus Christ. And not just that one day when you got saved, when you raised a hand, walked an aisle, talked to the pastor, said a prayer. We all need the saving work of Jesus Christ every moment of our lives. We need Jesus. We need him. And it is okay to be needy. In fact, I would encourage all of you, be codependent and super needy for Jesus. I have a dog. I love my dog. He's fantastic. Barnabas Polycarp Catherman, the most amazing dog. <laughs> but I'm not kidding. He is the most needy dog. I barely wake up. You ready to come out and play? I barely, like, I get up to get coffee. Let's go. He's like, here we, I'm so happy to see you. I'll lay down. I'll let you pet me. I'll do it. You pet him, and then he's back again for more and more. You let him out. You let him in. It's like, he is needy. He is needy. I think if he went for an hour without attention, he would die. <laughs> Maybe 30 minutes. But he is such a beautiful reminder of what Jesus wants of us. He wants us to look that much more needy all the time for Jesus Christ. We all need the saving work of Jesus Christ. We all should find our greatest joy in Jesus Christ. So I want to conclude with a thought. And while I have it numbered three, three things here, it's actually one thing. It's one thought. It's one encouragement. If we were to say, what do I do? It, what should I do? If you're sitting here and you don't know Jesus, you're not sure what happens next, or maybe you're like the older brother in the, in the prodigal son story, and you've been depending on the law, and you haven't really tasted and seen that the Lord is good. You haven't really found it. You've just been laboring and toiling, and you're just tired, and you're ready to sit down, put your feet up, and rest in the hammock that Jesus is strong for you. If that's you, or if maybe you just need a little boost, a little reminder, then here's the thought that I have from this text. Number one, know, I mean know the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not saying depend on the gospel for salvation. I'm saying know it. Know that when you see things that aren't the gospel, you can go, that's not the gospel. That's not how the gospel works. Oh, that sounds good, but not the gospel. I'd be able to identify what's not the gospel because you know the gospel inside and out. Why do you need to know the gospel so well? So that number, you can do number two. You can rehearse the gospel in your life every day. You can remind yourself. You can tell yourself the story. You can go, hey, you know, I'm struggling over here, but oh, the gospel. Oh, what about this over there? Oh, I, I, here's the gospel. Oh, you know what? I, I feel like I need to work to, to find my hope with God. No, 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 the gospel. Tell yourself the gospel every single day. Every day. Tell others the gospel. Let's be people who share this story all the time. All the time. Rehearse the gospel because you know the gospel. And then that should lead us to the third. This one only comes if you start doing the first and the second because you can't white knuckle this one. You can't force it. Cherish Jesus Christ above all else because he saved you. Dirty, stinky, sinner you, he saved you. When if anyone else were left to save you, they'd just chuck you to the curb, put a free sign, no one would take you, and eventually haul you to the dump. But not Jesus. Cherish him. Love him, because he loves you. Find your greatest enjoyment in him. Worship him. 
Praise his good name. Love him greatly. And you can't white knuckle it. You can only do that by knowing the gospel and then telling yourself the story. And then God is going to use that to open up your heart and open up your soul so that you just keep seeing Jesus working. And every time you see him working, you go, oh, I love him so much. Look what he did over here. Look what he did over there. Well, we saved that person. Can you believe it? And you're going to want to go and tell everybody about Jesus even more than you tell them about the discount at your favorite restaurant. Know and love and cherish Jesus because you know the gospel and you rehearse it. He's saving you. He's saving you. And he's sanctifying you. And he's literally carrying you all the way to your home to be with God forever. What a wonderful Savior we have. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that we do not have to depend on the blood of bulls and goats, that we do not depend in any way about our own works, our own gold stars, our old check the boxes, our, our own things. There's not one thing, God, we proclaim that, not one thing we could do. It's all garbage and nonsense if we do it thinking we're saving ourselves. Because, Lord, we praise you that you save. That while we were still sinners, you saved us. When we were in the mire, wallowing around in the mud, you saved us. You picked us up. You carry us. You love us. And Lord, you did it before we were even born. You've seen every sin we'll ever commit. You've seen our sinful hearts. You've seen the wicked things we've done. And then you died for us that we could be redeemed. We praise you for that, God. We thank you for that. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to cherish you, to enjoy you above all else, to love you, to rest in you. God, we can't do that. We can't force that. Only you can do that in us. And so it's my prayer, Lord, that, that for the person sitting here, maybe hurting, maybe doubting, maybe struggling, not even sure if you're really going to come through for, for her or him. Lord, please sh show them. Reveal yourself to them in, in some remarkable way. Maybe just a still, small voice, a quiet little thing. They go, whoa, that was Jesus. Bring comfort. Lord, help us to love you. God, we, we need this, please. God, help us to know the gospel well. And in that, Lord, we can work at this. So motivate us to read. Motivate us to ask questions if we don't know. Motivate us to talk about it. Motivate us to know it well. And God, remind us daily to, to rehearse it, to tell each other the story of your good news and to, to tell it to ourselves, to preach it into our hearts until we can't not believe it, that it's just overflowing in us and through us and to others. God, I'm praying you would do that in this church. In these people. Lord, I, I thank you so much that you would even consider saving us. Yet you do for your glory. May you be glorified in this place. May we worship you fervently, come before you in tremendous gratitude and love. In Jesus' name.